Welcome to Strength in Numbers, the podcast where we show you that together we can overcome any obstacle. Join us as we bring on world-renowned experts in the field of grit, determination, and perseverance. Lean on us for a prosperous future together. your hosts, Colonel Tim Nye and Neil Cohane. Welcome to Strength in Numbers. My name is Colonel Retired Tim Nye, and I am joined today, as I always am, by my good friend and our primary host and founder of Strength in Numbers, Mr. Patriot himself, Neil <laughs> Cohane. Today we are speaking with an American warrior and hero, Chief Warrant Officer 4, retired Jason Naz Nazrenko. Naz is a veteran of 14 combat deployments and served in the world's premier combat aviation regiment known to most simply as Task Force 160. If you're not familiar with that term, think about the movie Black Hawk Down. Naz is now retired but still serves and leads his community as a volunteer, as a pilot with his local sheriff's office, flying for Air Evac Life Team and being the president of his Chamber of Commerce. And he does all of this while working towards his PhD in management. So obviously, uh, we're, we've got a lot here to talk about and talk about with him because I'm kind of fascinated by that career path. But before we get started, we want to take a minute and remind everyone that every subscription and share helps support veterans across our nation. Whether you are listening on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or watching us on YouTube, please hit the subscription button below and know that you are making a difference in the life of a veteran. All right, so with that, welcome to Strength in Numbers, uh, Naz. Um, it's great to have you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, you bet. I uh, appreciate it. Thank you guys for uh, having me, and thank you for this uh, this podcast. I had the uh, I had the pleasure of listening to a few of your uh, other guests, you know, trying to do my own uh, due diligence research and seeing what you guys were about, and, uh, and you're about some good things. I love the, uh, the difference that you're making, uh, so I just want to give a shout out to you guys. I appreciate what you're doing. There's a lot of folks that need it. Uh, and and I love it. So keep up uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. As far, you bet. As far as uh, me, uh, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, I've got a, a career in the army, twenty three years. Uh, my wife and I we uh, we decided to join back in nineteen ninety six. Uh, came out of a little town called Cotter, Arkansas, and uh, we were just ready for something different. We needed to uh, you know we knew we needed to do something different to uh, to make something happen, and so we left out. And the army uh, was a good choice. It was an excellent career. Um, we had uh, multiple uh, different, you know, I had a few different jobs. I started out actually as a cook. I don't even know if I gave that to you uh, in the beginning. So <laughs> I was a, a cook in the army and um, did that until it was, wasn't was fun anymore. And then it was time to do something different. So uh, that's when I decided to become a pilot. And uh, that, that led me down an awesome career as well, which ended over there with uh, 160th. Uh, last 10 years were with with them and, and that was awesome great experience uh, I was among heroes every day uh, and it, it was uh, definitely definitely a life-changing experience being over there so um, that's that's pretty much it as far as uh, here you know just recently retired my actual retirement hasn't even been a year uh, October of last year was when I officially retired so since I've been out uh, picked up that job with uh, Aravac and then do a lot of stuff here in the city as far as with the Chamber of Commerce, just kind of helping out in the city. We're trying to grow our very small city uh, to uh, to be able to showcase it and, and draw some revenue in for the for the town so we can do some neat things. So that's pretty much it. Again, thanks. Well, listen, before we go on, I want to say, I mean, 160th is clearly kind of the, the, the shiny object, right? But I tell you what. Uh, having been a headquarters company commander and an S4 in my life, uh, I've walked through a DFAC or two uh, during my 32-year career. Uh, Neil, you may not know this, but uh, one, those cooks, my God, is that a hard job. That is a hard, <laughs> thankless, thankless job. Uh, and, but it also gets pretty competitive. And if I'm correct, you did pretty well in, in the uh, competitions as a cook as well, right? Did, did. you? Did, did you, what, you win, win uh, cook of the year or, or chef of the year or what did you win? I did. It was, uh, if I can remember right, it was 2001 when I was the cook of the year for uh, 101st 
airborne division. So all of Fort Campbell, I was the cook of the year for over there. All right. So how do you distinguish your scrambled eggs from everybody else? <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine didn't turn green quite as quick as everybody else's when they were in the cans. Yeah. yeah. So. yeah. Well, anyway, I mean, I'm making light of it a little bit, but uh, I have also worked in restaurants and owned one once upon a time in my life. That is just that is just hard work, and it's it's, you know, uh, soldiers coming in and eating chow at six in the morning. That means you guys are there at four or whatever, you know. And and, and right. you know, if they've got mid rats mid eating at midnight, those kinds of stuff on deployment, it's it's a twenty four seven mm -hmm. job. It re it really truly is. But that being said, that is quite a jump. I mean, to go from being a cook to being not only a pilot, but a pilot with the 160th, how, how did you kind of walk us through that? How did you, how, how did you achieve that? Because that's not something that's that usual. Well, um, I think for me, the, the biggest thing was when I had not decided, a, a buddy of mine, actually, we both talked about it and we decided we were going to do something different. We looked at, you know, what, what could our career paths be? You know, you had um, recruiting, you had uh, drill, you had uh, assessment for special operations and, you know, we kind of discussed it and we each had our own ideas. I really liked the idea of becoming a pilot. I wanted, you know, I, I felt like that was going to be a good fit. He wasn't interested in uh, being a pilot. So he, he said, okay, well you go see if that'll work for a little while. And if not, then you and I will go assess together. Um, and it actually worked well for me. I put in the packet for, uh, for flight, um, I was coming back from Iraq when I when I found out that I had been picked up, and it was it was after being looked at and then turned down, you know, once or twice. I think when I got looked at back then, you, you got two looks at least, uh, and then for some reason I think they didn't have enough pilots, so they actually had a third look, and on the third look was when I got picked up, uh, and it was after I was almost you know ready to to shift uh, to something different because I figured you know I hadn't gotten picked up and it was over. Uh, then I got the call that, uh, hey, you got picked up. You're on the OML. You're next. Uh, somebody dropped off if you want it. And I said, heck, yeah. So it was a good homecoming from Iraq back then. Awesome. So um, you, you said you, um, you, 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 you were going to tag team with your buddy to go into assessment. Does that mean the, uh, the Q course or is that? A right. We, I mean, obviously, you got to kind of assess for that as well. Put in a packet, assess. Uh, he ended up not doing that. He ended up... Uh, I think he just decided, hey, I want to go warn as well. So he stayed on the food service side. He's yeah. still in for a little while. He's up in Alaska. Oh, wow. uh, I think he's got about a year left now. And then uh, then he's going to call uh, call it quits. And he's, he's got an awesome career waiting for him right now because he's out there all the time guiding on, uh, on the uh, water and out in the woods. I see him all over the place, pictures of rams and oh, whatever man. else, you know, that you can be out there hunting. So he's, he's got a, a good time out there. So. Now tell the truth though, when you went warrant officer flights or warrant, what is it? Warrant officer flight school or warrant officer candidate school? That's it. Yeah. Warrant yeah. officer candidate school. Yeah. You, you had to be uh, second guessing your decision around that point. That, I've heard that school sucks. Is that right? It, it does suck. But the thing was when I went in, um, I was, and it is like, it has changed because I've got friends that have come through since I did and and, you know, just like everything else, it always, you look back, it's like, oh, it used to be hard. Now it's not. Right, right, right. Well, uh, I was an E6P when I went. So to me, you know, it was like, hey, all you got to do is shut your mouth, follow along, and you're going to do just fine. So I, I didn't have an issue with, with it at all. Uh, I was actually, when we uh, graduated, I was the, um, I think it was called the candidate class commander um, was what we did. So we were, you know, I graduated as the, the commander for the, for our class. So yeah, so you're so you're a pretty humble guy because you're you're actually a high achiever. You went in the, you became a cook. You were the cook of the year. You went off to the warrant officer school and you became the commander. That's uh, so you're, you're you perform a little higher level than most people. <laughs> I mean, I'm just that's just a fact. I mean, right, it's, right. It's obvious. Listen, you were like me. I went to uh, I went to OCS officer candidate school. I, I was already a marine sergeant, and I was an army officer candidate school. And the first couple of times I got in my face to yell, I, I was all I could do to almost not laugh. Like, do you think you're going to intimidate? I mean, it, what, right. what is the purpose of this yelling? Because it's, right. it's having very little effect. And it's, <laughs> and it's going to have very little effect. I just, I used to do this for a living myself. That's it. I guess you and I are probably the same. To me, it's like, if I'm going to do something, if it's worth doing, well, I'm going to give 100% at it. I'm not going to you know, go in and just, you know, stand around and, and look at people do the job and, and, you know, take the, take the credit afterwards. If you're going to do it, it's worth doing it hundred percent. Give, give all you can. 
Uh, and then that way, you know, you're going to, you're going to give you hundred percent of yourself and you can expect that coming back out as well. So you can at least walk away proud with your head high. So it's not all about accolades for me. It's, it's never been about, you know, getting recognition accolades or anything. So. No, but I think when you put yourself out there like that, as um, people follow you, um, if you're willing to do something uh, and do it yourself, and then you're at a leadership role, uh, the guys with you, behind you, in front of you are saying, yeah, I, I will go uh, and follow that guy, uh, be beside him or maybe even lead him. But uh, it's just a great example. And um, yeah, you being humble shows. It, it's incredible. And this is a common theme that we've had. You've said you've listened to some of our podcasts, but almost everyone we've had what well, it doesn't matter if they're you know under the limelight or above the limelight everyone has um been stars uh they people just might not know who they are uh but everyone's uh risen to the top and uh, everyone we've talked to colonel what you think has been extremely humble um and and and, and fly under the radar and, and although now you probably did fly under the radar for most of your career <laughs> in the chopper right so what, and that, that's a good segue. Let me tell the audience out there, what is, what is it like to fly, you know, under nods at night in mountainous terrain? You know, I, I mean, just what's, what's, going, what's going through your mind and what do you, what do you got to do to, to get, get there safely and get back, get everybody back? You know, really, honestly, it's always just 100% focus. It's, it's razor sharp focus because if you're thinking about other things, if you're, you know, contemplating what's going on back at home or, or whatever, uh, then you're not a hundred percent in, and, uh, there's a whole lot of people that are, that are relying on you to be focused in that cockpit, looking through those goggles, wherever those mountains are or whatever's happened around you. Uh, so it is, it's about being focused. Uh, that is the key is you have a mission to do. You're there for that one specific reason. And then the contingencies that could happen, uh, but you, you do that, and that's that's what your focus is on during that time. Yeah, so Naz, t tell, uh, like our audience, even though we've had a bunch of military people on, um, this really is for everyone. So you were an elite aviation helicopter unit, correct? Correct. Yep, and then... But the, best, were, the best in the world. The best in the world. And, and you, yep, yep, and, and you just didn't serve the Army, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you helped... Uh, MARSOC Raiders, the Marines, you help SEALs, you, you flew for everyone. Is that correct? Well, we don't really, you know, you don't, that's one of the key things is you don't really talk about any oh, kind of customers you have. So, yeah. Uh, no, understood. You, understood. you and, were the best that's out there. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, Neil, I think what you're, I mean, it's well known, well documented. It, uh, you know, um, on the uh, um, Osama bin Laden raid, those were 160th helicopters that went in. Yeah. So those were seals, but somebody had to fly those seals there, and that right. was easy. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, Naz, what uh, are we allowed to ask you? What type of helicopter you flew, or did you fly multiple yeah, different I, helicopters? I can tell you. So, uh, I flew a, a Blackhawk. Uh, the last one that I flew there was an MH60 Mike. Uh, we we started out with different variants, but uh, that one was the last one when I left there. Uh, Mike model. So. It's pretty much any of the Blackhawks that you see out there nowadays. That's that's what we were flying. Gotcha. And, yeah. and what do, and what do you fly for uh, your two civilian with your job and your your volunteer? So for the uh, for Aravac, I fly a uh, two hundred six, uh, and it's it's a Bell Jet Ranger. It's similar to the one that we learned to fly, like when you're in flight school. So over at Fort Rucker, that's what you learn to fly on. Uh, and then for the uh, for the sheriff's department, I've got an OH-58 uh, ah. Alpha Curly. Uh, so and it actually came out of uh, Fort Campbell. So it was, you know, I forget what it was called, but it was like a buyback deal where the government kind of pushed it on over to the civilian sector. And, yeah. Uh, is that, uh, forgive my ignorance, but is that a little bird? It's a little bit different than a little bird. Not quite as nimble, but uh, it is a uh, it's really just like a jet ranger. It's just a military you know, modified jet ranger is all it is. So. Uh, how old is that? It's old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're it's say, old. There's, a, there's a reason the military got rid of it. I mean, it's, that's, that's right. Like, that's it's right. A few years on that thing. That's right. They are. So it's, it's kind of funny because it's, you know, we actually have two of them and sometimes it gets hard to find parts on them when they're that old. So you've got to oh. do your best to keep them flying. So. Yeah. I imagine yeah. you do your best to keep them flying when you're in it. 
That's right. <laughs> I think I've, I think they got the oil the oil leak fixed, but before that, we were limited to about three hours because that's about how much oil you had left in that uh, that tail rotor. Oh, oh my so, God, Jesus! Yeah. So now let's uh, let's do this then. Let's switch a little bit from your military career since we really can't talk an awful lot about it, but. Um, uh, let's talk about the, the volunteer and, and, and the job with the sheriff department. Um, can you tell us about some of the missions that you're on? And, and you still have to be uh, uh, laser focused, but um, if you could walk us through. I know we were talking offline that your days can be 14, 15, 16 hour days. So uh, why don't you share that with us um, on your, like a day to day basis for you? You bet. Well, so the, the actual W-2 job that I've got with Aravac, that was, I mean, it's a blessing to have that, you know, move back home, small area like this to be able to find a job like that and put my, my, you know, abilities into action. And I mean, you are still helping the community. You're in within, within the community. And that, like we said, was a week on week off. I go uh, to the station and uh, you, you're there on station the entire time. It's a 12 hour shift. Uh, so that week off that I have, I'm on call here with the sheriff's office. And um, there's myself, there is one other pilot, but he's really uh, one step out the door. He's, he's ready to retire. Him and I are good buddies. And uh, I've known him since I joined the service. He was actually the sheriff when I joined the service. Um, oh, yeah. So it's, it's pretty neat, you know, kind of full circle, honestly. Uh, but um, him and I, we kind of take turns. Uh, here recently, I flew uh, as far as missions, and we can talk about them. Uh, there is, uh, we had one where a, a, a bad guy was, uh, running from him. Uh, he took off into the woods. We ended up getting out there. We got the dogs on him. Uh, and then he got held up in a house. Uh, so I had the sheriff with me. We did, uh, you know, just court on his area. And, um, you know, they, they brought the search area in. We, we located him. We knew where he was. And then once they got a search warrant, uh, they went in and got him. SWAT, SWAT went in and got him and got him and uh, two of his buddies. So two took three people off the streets, you know, that didn't need to be there. So yeah, good for you. Good for you. And and uh, I'm I'm envisioning um, uh, cops uh, on TV. You got the big spotlight and everything going as well. We do. We've got a spotlight. We've got one of the helicopters we've got. It actually has uh, FLIR. So I mean, it's it's set up pretty nice. It's not you know top of the line any you know by any means, but for right. a town like this, honestly, to be completely honest, to have that asset. Uh, in this area, it is a huge resource. I, I bet just to find people who are lost, maybe, or, uh, you know, it pick, we so do. explain what flare means to the audience. That's uh, forward looking infrared. So it's it helps you see through the night. It's going to pick up uh, heat signatures. So if you're looking for, you know, like you, like you said, if you're looking out there for somebody who's lost, uh, that is a, a huge asset. Um, we've got. Uh, like I said, we've got two birds, only one has the FLIR, but uh, we are a very rural area and we have a lot of hiking. We're around the Buffalo National Forest, Mark Twain National Forest. Nice. Uh, we help out other communities as well, not just our county, but if another you know, partner county says, hey, we've got a lost lost person or whatever that is, uh, we'll go out and look for them as well. So right. uh, our sheriff has the ability to you know put that asset wherever it needs to be. So you were saying earlier that um, with with the oil problem, you had about three hour flight time. So how many miles out is that, and how many my, many miles back is that? Or just give us an idea of how far uh, you can go. Well, see, everything's more by time than distance with that thing because it depends. Like if I'm in a in an orbit, you know, I'm not burning as much gas. So I see. it's really about time for me. I, I start a clock, you know, I'm looking at a time, uh, and then I'm I'm watching that fuel, so I can do a fuel burn when I get out there, but. Straight line distance, you know, you've got pretty decent legs on you. Um, I can go, I can go there and back about seventy miles, so I can oh, okay. you know, and still have a reserve without any worry and still have some some time in the bag. So, uh, but anything that I'm doing, you know, orbiting or whatever, I always plan for where am I going to get gas afterwards. So, gotcha, Colonel. No, I'm just wondering when, when you're flying around as a cop, are you missing having like a sniper in the back or any, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what did the, you <laughs> the last one the other day, and it's funny if, if this bad guy ever watches this this uh, this podcast or listens to this podcast, he'll he'll probably die laughing. But um, so we had we had left while they were waiting for the um, while they're waiting for the uh, warrant because you got to get a warrant in order to get it in the house. I mean, it, it's you know there's rules and stuff. So we left to go get some more gas. And then uh, we sat for a little while. I just sat listening on the radios. Once I, once I got all the gas I needed, the sheriff, he, he was out, took care of some of his stuff. And then uh, I called him back in when it was time to get in. And when SWAT was was leaving with the warrant, 
right? And, uh, on the way back over, um, I kind of did a, uh, a low pass on the house that the guy was in. It's kind of a little psychological warfare. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Incoming. We're back, you know, because he was he was just about to get woke up pretty bad anyway. So we we uh, we came in pretty low and and allowed uh, on a quick turnout on him. So yeah, that that, that just reminded me of uh, that that the helicopter with apocalypse. Now, what was the song they were playing uh, on the speakers? Oh, that's, the that? of, that's the flight of the Valkyries. That's yeah. it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. You got to get that, Naz. Do some psychological yeah. warfare. That would be right. nice. Actually, the sheriff he did talk about us getting a big speaker. So, and he's he is man enough to do it. I, I tell you. <laughs> yeah, and you're in part of the country that you could probably get get away with that as well. Oh yeah, so, yeah. yeah. I tell you what. And now I will I will plug in case any Arabac ever sees or hears of this, but Arabac is no. There is. It's just up, down, over. You know, you you fly straight and level. Uh, yep. There is. You know, uh, no dangerous. You know, part of the dangerous part of the flying is just the, the fact that you're flying. But we're very safe with airbag. So, not that I'm not safe with the sheriff, but I've got a little bit more leeway. Yep, I hear you. I yeah, hear but, you. You're, but you're airbag. I mean, you're what you're picking up car people in car wrecks. People. I mean, I imagine out in rural communities, maybe just getting to their homes quicker than an ambulance could or something. But right. you know, that's that's life saving every time you're on the on the job. I'd imagine. It does. I mean, you're, you're providing access for those people. They're, you know, hours, you know, you're turning minutes into hours for them uh, in those rural communities. So you're, you're uh, especially your stroke patients, you know, heart attacks, things like that. You're, uh, you're getting them in that golden hour to where they need to be. Yeah. So that, that, that's the, that's the, the, the term golden hour, correct? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> um, do you want to talk a little bit about that, both, both combat and, and civilian life, what that golden hour means? Well, I mean, it's so really they always talk about a golden hour that that time frame from when you're whatever that accident occurred or whatever, if, whether it was a heart attack, stroke, or whatever. If you're not at that place or if you don't get that medicine that you need in that short time frame, uh, your chances of uh, survival are, are greatly reduced. Right. So, um, you know, by that that air back asset, uh, I mean, that's saving lives, just getting them to the hospital, just getting them to a uh, next level care where they might be able to have that uh that medicine that's going to, that's going to help them uh, get through that stroke or whatever that, uh, whatever it is. So. And, and do you fly by yourself or do you, do you have a co-pilot or how, how does that work? No, there's uh with, with Aravac, it's a single pilot. Uh, actually what's next to you is uh, the patient's legs. So oh, no, the head, okay. yep, head of the patient is back there with the, uh, we've got a medic and a nurse uh, with us at all times and they're very well trained. So a great, you know, great crew right there. You got a pilot plus some nurse and a medic. I mean, you couldn't ask for uh, really anything more. So, yeah. So you're still working with the team. You've worked with the team your whole life, and I am. And it's, you know, to be completely honest, you know, that team dynamic is uh, incredible um, because there's there's pros and cons with everything, you know, and, and there was some challenges with with uh, transitioning. Um, my wife and I, you know, we were we kind of I think both had different expectations of what you know, transitioning from the military or quote unquote retirement looked like. Um, and, and it was, it doesn't look like what we thought it was, was going to. Uh, but for me with the, the team that I've got with Aravac is uh, one of the reasons for sure that I'm still there because right. that, that team is uh, incredible. Yeah, that's really cool. And, and I think the three of us understand the importance of teams. And um, uh, I think we can, we can all kind of reflect on what's going on in this country mm -hmm. right now. And, the importance for the, the all of us, um, now as you're probably, I don't know, maybe you're a little bit younger than me. Um, Colonel is a, the, 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 he's the, clearly younger than me. Go on, move on. Right, right, right. So, but no, but we grew up with teams. I mean, everyone was on a team and, and you build that camaraderie, you build that friendship that you normally, you know, you're in high school or middle school and you might not, you might pass a guy in the high in the hallway and not make eye contact or whatever the case is. But when you're on a team, you're part of a family, you're part of that tribe. And Colonel and I and I are both part of on the fringe of a Spartan race and they call that family a tribe. And you've had that in the military. Now you have that after the military. It's just uh, it's incredible. It, it's a great feeling for me. I, I love being part of teams and contributing. And um, it's such a it, it's much better feeling that you've accomplished something with someone else than, than by yourself with, without a doubt. That's right. Yeah. Um, I, I just let me, Neil, I mean, we've got, there's the team aspect of it. And then I think for a transition, I think Na I'd get curious Naz's thoughts here as well. It's, it's also for a lot of guys, they have trouble transitioning because they went from 
knowing their value or their worth as a team member, but where they fit in, in mm -hmm. that cog. And they either uh, having to accept a job where, where they don't feel it's, to me, it's either, you know, worth slash respect, right? I mean, that you've got to have a job where you, you have some worth to it. There's not, not and, and, and I'm not talking money. I'm talking, you know, that you're doing something important, um, that, that you, the person, feels it's important and that other people give you respect for it. I think that's a, a part of the transition. I think uh, the guys that are struggle finding that job uh, or identifying what that worth is, I think they have a little bit more trouble. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, that's, if, if you don't have, uh, you know, people always say, if you don't enjoy what you're going to, what you're doing, you're not going to do it for long. And that's, that's gotta be true for sure. Um, but the key there is, you know, if you don't enjoy the people that you're doing it with, you're, you're definitely not going to do it long. So. Um, you know, that, that team makes or breaks, you know, whether you're, you're going to stick around. And I mean, you see it every day in uh, Aramac and our teams, you see other bases that don't have that real strong team and they, they struggle, you know, they, they do, you know, you'll have little arguments, you'll have little tiffs and stuff. And, you know, everybody's, you're, you're a lot of type A personalities in, in this kind of a, an environment. And so when you get people with a type A and they're not getting along, it's, it makes it tough. So. It sure does. And it shows, you know, it shows in work, no matter what you do. If you're, if you're in the business of saving lives with both, both your volunteer and, and, and W2 job does, uh, you, you don't want that to be showing that uh, you're not getting along with the team. But I, I think with that, um, we're going to take a pause here. Uh, and this is where we tell our audience to just hang in there, uh, listen to uh, one or two commercials. And this is how we make money to pay, um, our, our fund or help fund special op excursions that's run by a great guy named Scott Graves. And we'll get into that with uh, Naz on the way back in. All right. Welcome back everyone. So um, we have uh, Jason Naz Nazarenko with us and we've gone through some of his uh, military life and, and, and afterwards he decided not to retire, but to continue to give back uh, with the sheriff department and also uh, a meta, meta flight type uh, thing that, that, that brings people to hospitals. Um, he also does a lot in the community with the Chamber of Commerce and some other things he's involved in. But um, Jason, why don't you, um, and this is no surprise to Colonel and I, and I every single person we've had on um, just continues to give back even though they've served their entire lives. So we, why don't you talk a little bit about what you do with your, if where you find the time, number one, uh, to, to work with the Chamber of Commerce and the the, uh, the town that you're with. Uh, you bet. <clears throat> so Neil, as, as, as you mentioned, you know, for me, you know, coming back home, and I don't know if we had talked about that, but I ended up coming right back to my hometown uh, that I left when I left for the service 23 years ago. I came to uh, Cotter, Arkansas. Uh, population says on the sign 950. I'm not sure what the uh, census is going to say when it comes back. We all think it's probably a little bit low. Right. Uh, uh, but small town uh, for me, I came back with a uh, with an attitude like like the colonel and I talked about. If you're going to do something, I do it 100 percent. So when I came back, I, I looked at, you know, how can I get involved? How can I uh, get in, involved and bring some value to the town? Um, again, not just monetary, not just, you know, throwing money around or anything, not that we're, we've got money anyway to throw around, but how can I add value to this community? What can I bring that they had that they didn't have before? Uh, but now from my experiences, what can I bring to the table to help them out? And so I saw a ton of different ways that we could get involved. And so my wife and I, we got involved with the city. Uh, one of the big things they had was, uh, it was called Christmas in Cotter. Uh, last year, this was the first time ever, they lit up the uh, park downtown, uh, down in our, our little town. And um, I, I've all, I told the, uh, the mayor and uh, the other folks in the town, I said, hey, what we'll do is our family will donate uh, s'mores and hot cocoa for the event. And it was funny because when, when I brought it up, we got some crazy looks. It was like, <laughs> nah, it work. You know, why, we don't want that. And I was like, trust me, trust me, it'll work. It'll be good. Uh, I don't think anybody really truly understood, but you know, of course, you now I had spreadsheets out. I had a PowerPoint of, hey, this is where this is where I'm going to set up the fires. This is, you know, how people are going to get in and out safely. You know, right. and uh, we had uh, over 500 people 
at that event. And uh, s'mores and hot cocoa were a huge, I think probably the only person that got any more visibility was Santa himself out there. So. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So you, but, had, you had more than half the town there then, right? Oh, it was it was incredible. And there was people from all over. So a uh, great, great time. Uh, and it was something that really drew attention to the town. I mean, the, the, the folks in the town loved it. Uh, and then just everybody else that heard about it as well. So that really kept, you know, we kind of kept that going of how could we, you know, boost the town? How could we do different things? And uh, one of them was um, the Chamber of Commerce, as you mentioned. They, they kind of uh, approached me. I was volunteering in different different things. And the mayor said, hey, you ever think about being the chamber president? And uh, I actually, I told him, I said, you know, I don't need a position to make an impact. I, I don't have to have something to go on a resume. I don't have to, you know, to me, I'm, I'm volunteering. I want to be involved, uh, but I don't need any position for it. Right. Um, and I met with the chamber and the chamber, you know, they, they, they said, Hey, we're, we're really interested in you taking on this position. It's a volunteer position, as you mentioned. Um, and, and I, for me, you know, mentally I knew, man, if I take it on, that's one more thing. You know, I'm on school, you know, working on school, I've got work, I've got, you know, all these things. And I knew it's one more thing. And my wife knew the same thing and she knew exactly how I would approach it. I'd be you know, hundred percent in. It's like, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it hundred percent. Yeah. Um, well, of course, you know, I, I wasn't at the meeting when they voted on it, but they voted me in as the president and uh, I was at work that night. Uh, but uh, as soon as we got, as soon as we, uh, as soon as I took over as the president, I just jumped in and got involved. And one of the things uh, we were setting up for Trout Fest, uh, that was a big event that was coming up. And uh, we're a big trout fishing community. We're in a vacation area. So yep. we, you know, set that all up. And of course, like, again, I had spreadsheets. I had, you know, PowerPoint, you know, I was given uh, different briefings and stuff. And we were set to have an awesome, awesome uh, uh, trout fest. It was, it was going to be the best one that they'd had. We had a bunch of different things added. Well, then of course, COVID came along and uh, we got COVID, I call it COVID it out. Uh, so we got, we got passed on with COVID, uh, but I said, hey, we're not gonna let it, you know, we're not gonna let it kill it. We've got everything. We're just shelf this for a little while. We yeah. postponed, uh, we, we ended up having to postpone a full year, but that's okay. Uh, we'll, we'll put it on next year and we'll be good. Um, just recently, uh, back in June, actually it was before June, I asked the mayor, cause I mean, I was ready. I was like, hey, there's needs to be something else happening. What else can we do? Uh, and I asked him, I said, hey, if you don't mind, I'm going to set up uh, movies in the park. I've got to get with the Department of Health and, and put a, a business plan together because, of course, you have to you know, meet those guidelines for bringing groups together. I said, if you don't have an issue with it, I'll put it together. And he said, no, that's, that sounds fine uh, as long as you can get approved. So I, I built a business plan, showed how we were going to meet their criteria. And uh we put it together. We had, um, I, I finally got the approval. Of course, at first it wasn't approved, but um, I, I took that as no problem. You, you're telling me I can't do it. Well, let's, let's get on the phone. Let's figure out what is missing. Let's change that. Let's put those in, put those changes in action. Let's do it. And uh, we got it finished. Uh, we showed the first movie and uh, we had a bread out about 150 people. Uh, which was incredible for our small town. Um, and it was neat. We had uh, the movie, shined on this bridge uh, i actually displayed it on the bridge it's a historic bridge and we were all underneath the bridge uh down in the park by the river it was awesome so, so and it was all free for everybody so it was incredible yeah we're, we're all craving for a contact human connection and um that's that's the tragedy here is is you know like whatever is going on right now is humans are social creatures and that's kind of been taken away from us so naz thank you for for doing that and getting it uh done and getting 150 people there i'm sure the next one is going to be even bigger with your um uh, fortuitiveness uh behind it um so let, let's talk a little bit about the town you mentioned the trout fest is that for locals only or do people come around the area yeah, they come from all over. Uh, in the past, they've actually given away boats, I think, for, for oh, years. Sure. To, to kind of give you an idea of where we're at in the world, you know, you think Arkansas, you think, in, you know, flat land or whatever. We're actually I'm in the mountains. Netflix, uh, Ozarks, that's what I'm thinking yeah. of. Well, like, we're, we're, in, uh, we're in a vacation spot. I mean, we are really, truly – have you ever heard of Ranger boats? Oh, sure. Yeah. Ranger bass boats. They're made yeah. in flipping Arkansas. I don't know okay. if you ever knew. It says it on each one of them. Ranger boats, flipping Arkansas. Flipping Arkansas is five miles up the road. I got you. So we are right in pristine 
uh, country with two lakes. They call the Twin Lakes area, Bull Shoals, North Fork. We've got the river, uh, the White River, the Buffalo River. Um, I mean, this place is, it's a playground for outdoors, uh, outdoors uh, events. I mean, it just, it's just incredible. Um, our little town here of Cotter sits right in the bend. It's the only town that's completely surrounded by the White River. So it is a, it's a playground. I mean, this place is just gorgeous. It's just, it had pretty much died. There was one, one business in the town really. Uh, yep. By the time I got back here, um, we have a kayak shop that it does really well. Uh, but, but that's really it. We didn't really have anything else. And we're, that's what we're trying to gain that momentum so that we can draw the business back in and we can get some other folks in um, and then give the vacationers something to do when they're here. So, yeah. So tell me a little bit about that. Do you, it, you have bed and breakfast, you have hotels, motels, what, what's in your town that to, um, to get are you, are you setting up a trip meal? Cause you want to know about the fish. <laughs> I'm thinking about bringing Mike Updike there cause he's got a connection with Ranger Boat. So we'll talk about that offline, Jason. And, and then, um, no, but I'm just thinking about maybe when the, when the trout fest happens, I just want people to be, uh, to, to know what Cotter is and, and what's available to them if they come visit and fish. Yep, you bet. And I mean, not only the trout fish, but year round, this is year round trout fishing. Uh, but we've got a lodge here. Uh, it's an older lodge. We've got a small restaurant. We do have that. A lot of Airbnbs, vacation rentals, VRBOs, whatever you want to call them. Uh, yep. I myself, we renovated a, um, it's an old house. It's near, it was an old business, really. It was an old, um, nearly 100 year old apartment building. Uh, and we did a full renovation on that. And we have two vacation rentals that are uh, on the first floor and we live on the second floor. And then uh, we've also fixed up a couple other small places, uh, small little houses. And then we're working on a church now for another vacation, uh, vacation spot. And uh, we were, you know, COVID kind of got one other thing for us to talk about a trip. We had a, um, a spec ops excursions uh, trip yeah. sep at September. Um, I had been working with Scott and we were going to bring out uh, like six guys out from Fort Campbell because it's only about a six and a half hour drive. Right. Put them on our vacation rentals. I had guides all laid on that they were going to go out with. So guys show up if they wanted to fish, you know, fly fish or spin fish, whatever. They take them out. They didn't need to bring anything with them. Go out and have a blast. But uh, one more thing that I, you know, uh, it's not over. It's just postponed. You know, we'll, we'll put right. that on our calendar. Uh, as soon as we can, as soon as I know that those soldiers can leave, their their commands will let them leave and they can travel uh, safely, then we'll get them out here and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, put them up. They're going to have an awesome time. I, I love the attitude. Never quit, never never retreat, never surrender, which is great. Um, when is the Trout Fest for, you postponed it, but when is it? Is it on the calendar for 2021 or? Yeah, it's uh, usually the first weekend in May. Right. Uh, so, and that's when it'll be... Uh, We'll still stick with that same time frame. It's usually a really good time for fishing. Uh, fishing is great. Uh, we've got some bugs that are always hatching around that time, so the, the trout are getting you know out there like crazy. So uh, that's right. that's well, the, the time. Count, count me in. I'll, I'll bring a guy from third group if you'll accept them. Scott will yeah. fight for him. Uh, we'll come out. You can teach me how to fish. M M Mike's a great dude. You'll love him. Awesome. Um, so let's. Um, we're, we're I, I think probably forty minutes into this. Um, Jason, why don't we talk a little bit about, I give Scott and Special Op Excursions a, a plug every, Colonel and I and I both do uh, at the end of every uh, podcast, but is there anything that you want to kind of talk about that hits near and dear to your heart? Is it, um, you know, what do you want to talk about and, 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 and how can we help you get, uh, get people to um, get eyes on that? You bet. Well, I'll, you know, I'll plug uh, Scott as well, uh, just like you do. Scott Graves, um, man, his his friends, family out there, it is incredible. Yeah. I was on the very first um, trip that Scott ever, I call it trip event that Scott ever set up. Yeah. Uh, I, I kind of heard about it from a friend who said, hey, you want to go on this, um, on this, uh, I think it was a turkey hunt. You want to go on this turkey hunt? It wasn't far, about an hour or so from where we lived. Uh, and coming from, you know, spec op, special ops background, you know, you kind of, everything is always, I'm wary of everything. It's like, okay, sure. what, what's, what's happening? You know, somebody's in, you know, somebody's doing something to figure something. I don't know. You're yeah. always watching. And uh, so we show up to this, you know, farm out in the, uh, out in the woods. And I don't know if you've been out to Scott's place, uh, but beautiful okay. country. Yeah. Beautiful. But I mean, you're just you're always just waiting. Okay. Like what's, what's happening. Somebody's going to try to do something, you know, something's happening. 
Um, and it wasn't. It was just a bunch of, you know, truly giving Americans that, that just wanted to give back. Yeah. And that's all they did. The majority of them actually had no connection to the military other than friends. Uh, they had never served themselves, but they all were just great Americans and they just wanted to, how can we help? How can we give back? How can we, you know, pay it forward? And uh, it was incredible. So after that, Scott and I stayed in contact. We, I went on a couple of different trips with him, one of which actually was with my son. Nice. Uh, a, a duck hunt trip with my son and had a blast. Uh, we, we, we had a great time. Uh, and so when I, when I got out, when I transitioned, you know, one of the, one of the key things that I was immediately thinking of was how can I set up a trip here uh, so that we can uh, bring Scott's guys out here. And, and uh, you know, I immediately started talking to him. I didn't even have the, uh, the Airbnb set up yet. And I was like, Hey, we'll put them up. We'll, we'll figure it out. I'll, I'll, I'll put them up. And, uh, and so now it's, you know, we'll, we'll get it out. Like I said, we'll get it on a calendar. We'll figure out the, the day that'll work and we'll put it there. So um, awesome. as far as like a, a nonprofit here local, um, yeah. for me, our, our Chamber of Commerce is a nonprofit. So it's the Cotter Gasfield Chamber of Commerce. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on uh, our website as well. And from that website, you can find all the businesses uh, that are in the town of Cotter and Gasfield. You can find things to do, places to see. And uh, so that way, when you do, if you ever do decide to come out for a vacation, uh, you might fall in love with the place. I'll warn you that a lot of people that come out here end up buying a house and staying because it's a uh, it's a little known secret out here in, in north central Arkansas. Well, you piqued my curiosity. How far is the, the nearest airport from you guys? How, how far of a drive is it? Uh, well, you can fly into the nearest one. I tell you what, uh, Nashville to Harrison is, I think, less than one hundred dollars. OK, and, uh, you can fly Dallas to Harrison for about 100 bucks or 150. I think it's called Southern Airways. Yeah, uh, that's a pretty close one. Harrison, we've got Midway has got a small airport, but that's a little bit quite a bit smaller. Uh, yep. Springfield is right up the road. And that's that's the one that a lot of people fly in and out of easy to get in and out. So cool. Well, Colonel and I's got a buddy who, who loves to fly so he can get <laughs> in a small airplane. I'll, I'll come in commercial from Nashville into into hey. Harrison. So, yeah. Um, Colonel, do you have um, you have any thoughts or questions for, for Naz before we um, roll into the um, exit? No, just so it's Cotter, and the other one is Glassville. Glass. Uh, Gasville. It's G A. Yep. G -A well, I'm, I'm asking because I've got I I pulled you up on the map while you were talking. I got the satellite view, and he does. Cotter sits mm -hmm. like almost in a peninsula, so the river wraps around. Yep. Right. Wow. But it I does. don't. Think, so Gasville's got to be very small because I don't see that on the map at all. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it is a small place, but I mean, honestly, Gasville's got, they, they've got the business and we've got the sites, you know, because Gasville doesn't have the river, you know, like we do. So well, no, the, and, only, the only other thing I, I'm going to, I'm sorry there, Neil. The only other thing is, so again, I kind of said in the opening, you're, you're take, you've taken on all these different things at the same time, you're still pursuing your doctorate degree, correct? You're you're trying to get a PhD. I am, um, and it's 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 tough. I tell you, it's uh, I'm all finished with my curriculum, so all the classes are finished. Uh, if you're familiar with the programs at all, after that you got to write a a, a, um, a dissertation, uh, and that has got you know a process as well. I'm already finished with the uh, prospectus. Uh, right now, I'm I'm uh, taking a little bit of a break. I'm going to take at least a semester or two off while I'm, while I'm just kind of getting a few other things uh, set up, but uh, they are, uh, it's, it's a long process. You got eight years to do it. I think I've been at it for two years now. So I got quite, quite a while before I, I time out on it. So. Well, that's uh, what I was going to ask is when did you start this? Because I know how long it takes. Yeah, I, I started it. Uh, gosh, it was, it was about two years ago. I'm almost two years into it right now. So. I was still on active duty when I started it, and it was really just classes that I was taking uh, back then, and then got all the classes finished. Uh, before I got out of service, I was finishing my classes and just started the dissertation process after that. Do, yeah. do you know what the dissertation's going to be? Sorry, Colonel. Say that again? Uh, do you know what your dissertation's going to be yet? Yeah, I do. So it's actually on the transition process of career veterans. Um, um, so it's specifically like the Colonel and I, we're, we're considered career veterans. Anybody 20 plus years? Uh, and the transition process for a 20 plus year veteran looks different than, you know, a single term veteran. You know, somebody did two, four, six years. It's quite a bit. And the colonel touched on it like a little bit. You know that 
how are you, you know, fitting into a team? How are you, you know, what's the meaning to your life at this point? You know, so there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, inputs, sensory inputs and, and, and everything that you really look at. So uh, it's really about that process and uh, how we can optimize it, uh, honestly. Yeah, I mean, just the word veteran is just kind of uh, interesting in itself. I mean, mm -hmm. how, how broadly w w that covers uh, and, uh, you know. Again, anybody served, served. They have my respect. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it's a, it, it's a, it can mean a lot, uh, different mm -hmm. things to different people. Even, even DOD has kind of a slightly different view of it than the VA does. Kind of. So anyway, um, no, I was asking about the PhD as well. My my son is a SF captain. Uh, actually, came out on the majors list, but just awesome. last week, last week was his last week active duty. Uh, he got out. Uh, specifically to pursue a PhD because it, it's just too hard to do on active duty to, right. you know, they're not, they're not going to give you that kind of time off. Um, no. <laughs> and it, you know, and it's just too hard to kind of, kind of go one way or the other. So he's staying national guard, stay in SF national guard. Um, but yeah, just basically said, Hey, I can't, this is what I want to do. I've got a, I got a cutter. Right. I got to get rid of one or the other here. I can't do them both kind of. Very few people have, have done that. So anyway, no, listen, it's the same thing we say every week just about is um, I, I really appreciate, you know, people like yourself who do so much for other people, the volunteer work you're doing. And again, we kind of made a joke of it. You're a very high achieving guy, but very humble. Again, a common trait uh, that, that we're seeing a lot. And, and thank God we've got people like you and others out there who, who, constantly put others first, other people's uh, needs first, uh, and just looking for, you know, something good um, in their communities. And that, that's really important because, as Neil said, you know, I mean, obviously we got COVID. We've also got some uh, social strife going on, which is not good. And I think for combat vets, I, I, I don't like it. I don't like the look of it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, it leaves a very distasteful taste in my mouth. Uh, mm -hmm. So... I, I I appreciate anybody trying to do do good. So, and I think that's that's you clearly. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Colonel. And, and as uh, before, we wrap up here. Uh, I want you to hold on, and I'll take us off record. But um, you know, it, just just one final point, if, if we can go off, uh, uh, not from a low point, but into a high point. Can you? Um, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but tell us about a low point in your life. But you know, you are a high achieving guy and you don't have quit in your vocabulary, you know, for people listening to us and, and, and Colonel and I, and, and I, what we try to do is bring on people who are tough mentally, uh, maybe not physically, but definitely mentally. Um, and, and they persevered grit, determination, and perseverance through any obstacle they've ever had in their life. And, you know, all three of us have had a team to, to instill that into us. Some people, especially the younger generation, weren't part of teams and they, they have nothing to fall back on to build confidence with or have a teammate that they can lean on. Can, can you talk about something that might have hit you the wrong way or you weren't expecting, but give us an example of how you got out of it and maybe talk to our audience about, you know, th there is always light at the end of the tunnel? Yep, you bet. Um, and I think that's very, very important because uh, life isn't always about just, you know, your life is never going to be just 100% successes constantly. No matter what you do, you're going to stumble, you're going to uh, falter, uh, and every one of us does. And, and really, what, what you're really truly going to be judged on is how you come through that, how you react to that, that falter, how you react to that failure, if you want to call it that. And it's truly not a failure. It's a, you know, it's a learning experience, you know. Uh, for me, I, I can look back on, for me, one of the things that uh, I would say a challenge that I came through would be uh, when I was in 160th, I think I was in at that point less than a year, or right at a year. And you kind of, you have a certain path that you're, that you're going through in, in, uh, in task force. Uh, and on that path, you go from being BMQ, basic mission qualified to FMQ, fully mission qualified. Uh, and then if, if you choose that route, you could go to a, a flight lead route. Uh, there is other routes uh, as well, but a lot of times people will go like a flight lead or uh, stands, stands or, or, or maintenance. Um, and I was on the BMQ route to FMQ route and uh, started to kind of stumble. Wasn't really, uh, you know, some of it could have been 
environment. Some of it could have been my attitude. Some of it could have been others. But anyway, started to stumble and got really discouraged. And uh, to the point where I was like, uh, really felt like it was it was the end at that point. Felt like, okay, this is this is going to be it. I'm going to be uh, kicked out. And I mean, you literally can be kicked out of 160th. Yep. Uh, so if it's at some point you're not found to be, you know, what they need, you're going to be you're going to be kicked out and put somewhere else. Uh, and I felt like that was probably what was going to happen. And um, it didn't. Uh, I was I ended up um, transitioning to a different uh, structure. So I ended up going into the maintenance side of it uh, and it really worked out well. I ended up being the um, it, it kind of it, it seemed like to me at one point it looked like I was going to uh, fail. And then what it actually turned out to be was a great avenue for me to get into uh, something that was really meaningful and felt like I could really be uh, giving back. And, and it was a great fit. Uh, ended up in the uh, in the we call it uh, um, our <laughs> For like for the civilian side, it's called the uh, operations uh, management in the um, in the army. It is the um, the maintenance side. I forget what the I, I even forget now what we called it. But anyway, stayed on the maintenance side as opposed to uh, the FMQ route. Um, yep. And for me, it, it 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 hit hard at first, and then it really was a uh, it was an enlightening experience for me. It was a great learning experience because I felt like you know what I picked myself up and just pushed myself on. Um, and I encourage others to do the same thing because you're you're not a failure unless you you quit. When you say I'm done, you throw in the towel. That's when you allowed whatever that was to get the best of you. It took you over and it, it chewed you up and spit you out. When you take it, when you take whatever it is and you choose that you are not going to allow it to get you down, not not going to allow it to to cause you to be a failure. And you take it and you pivot to something else, whatever that is. You pivot to that other that other door, that right there is what makes you a success. And that's how you're, you're going to end up winning in the end uh, at whatever you're doing, because you are not accepting defeat. And Jason, who, this is an easy one for you. So listen, who <laughs> doesn't, who doesn't quit? The night stalkers don't quit. Night stalkers don't quit. That's an easy, that's that their good. motto. That's their motto, Neil. Yeah, that's, that's right. Softball, Colonel. That was a good one. But, but Jason, <laughs> so failure, everyone needs to know this failure is not, the end all be all, unless you choose it to be. That's right. And That's then, right. and the thing is that the the FMQ did not work out for you, but all you did was pivot. That's and, right. And, and there there are some things in life that you're going to get to a wall that, mm -hmm. you know, like 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 me, I, I find a wall and and I'll do my darndest to get through it, over it, or around it. But sometimes that just that wall is just too big, and and that doesn't mean it's the end of the road. It just means all right, that wasn't for me. I yeah. got to make a rational decision here. Let's pivot to something else and take your experiences. And how can I be better in something else? So failure is not permanent. It's pivoting and, and finding something else that you can excel at. And, and then, oh, by the way, teach uh, along the way. So that's a great way to end the, 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 the podcast, Jason. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you. And, and this is where we go into our rollout where um, really none of this would be possible without a, a, a great woman, Michelle Burr who is, is really a leader in the country on the nonprofit world. Uh, we built this uh, podcast out to help leaders in nonprofits, and it just ended up turning into a grit, determination, and perseverance uh, podcast. But she's brought us some amazing guests. She's always in the background giving us ideas. And, and I can tell everyone listening that if you are thinking about starting a nonprofit, if you're thinking about being involved in a nonprofit, or you're, you're in your mid-cycle or end cycle of a nonprofit, Michelle Burr from In Bloom Consulting uh, is a person you need to reach out to. Uh, she can talk you through anything and, and make you better, make your nonprofit better. And the last thing we always talk about, and, and Naz already touched on this, is Scott Graves is a patriot. He's a great American with his, with his wife, Rachel. Uh, they gave up, uh, he gave up a very lucrative career um, to give back to uh, the, the heroes that are in the front lines every day that uh, we don't know they're out there, but they're they're helping us and saving us day to day. Uh, Scott, right now through Special Op Excursions, has has a new program called Socks Box, and that's Special Op Excursions Box. So Socks Box, and they're sending out care packages to Special Operations guys out in Syria and Iraq that we most people don't even know they're there, but they're doing very dangerous work and putting their lives on the line for us every day while we're consumed with COVID and the riots and everything. Um, Scott has not retreated. He has not quit. 
uh, and he's out there doing great things. So if anybody wants to look Scott Graves up with special ops excursions, uh, look them up uh, on their website. So uh, thanks, guys. Great, great, great talk. Naz, great meeting you. Uh, yeah, great meeting you. Yep. Yeah. Uh, Colonel? Yep. We'll talk to, you next, talk to you next week. Hold on, sir. Hey, Naz. Nice talking to you. Nice talking to you, too. Strength in Numbers is produced by B Viral Production. Find out how B Viral can produce your next show, commercial, or podcast at www.bviralproduction.com.